Um, I think that's it. Matthew chapter 28 is where we find ourselves. Title of the message is Commissioned. And we will get into what this means as we wrap up. Also, um, Matthew 28. Let's see. So before we start, let's, let's just, you're going to hold up your hands of, of how many people do you think uh, you maybe have discipled? Let me explain it a little bit. So the Bible calls us to discipleship. We're going to end the chapter with the Great Commission. That's why the title of the message is Commissioned. But just, you hold your hand up. If it's zero, you can just hold a, hold a fist up. If you think it's two or five or seven, if I see two hands, ten, that means probably more than ten. So put your hands up. Let me see how many you think you may have discipled in your lifetime. Uh, just two. Does children count? Children absolutely count. Any human being on the face of the planet. All right, some of you not participating. Uh, Awesome, awesome. All right, so at the end of the study, we should be able to determine what discipleship truly is, what it looks like, what it should be, and how all of us are commissioned. This should be a burden. It should definitely be something that we look forward to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask your blessing upon this time. Speak to us through your word, Father, as we lift this time up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, forgot to button my shirt. You guys are seeing my, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Sandlot. Killing me, Smalls. That's what that's all about. And if you don't know what Sandlot is, I'm praying for you. Sandlot. It's one of the best. So we left Jesus in Matthew chapter 27 um, on the cross. Seven sayings from that cross. Amazing to me that Jesus in mortal agony is thinking of others, praying for others, talking to the Father about others, making sure that his mom is taken care of, making sure that his, his buddy disciple John is going to look out after moms after he's gone from the earth. And just incredible. Doesn't pray for himself until he gets to the fifth thing from the cross, which is, I thirst. And, and even that is not for himself. He wants to make sure that it is intelligible, that, that it is articulate what he says right after that when they give him something to drink and just that loss of blood, the tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth and now I thirst, being able to just be able to get that juices, if you will, in his mouth so that he can say it is finished, to talistai, paid in full. The debt has been paid in full. He proclaims it. And then he commits his spirit to his father after that. So just what a blessing. We left him on the cross. Right after that, the religious leaders would go to Pilate and say, Hey, we remember that that deceiver said that on the third day he was going to rise from the dead. And if you know it's going to be a hoax. His disciples will probably steal his body. So Pilate, secure the tomb. And Pilate, in, in my opinion, in a, almost a state of mockery, he's like... Good luck with that. He, he doesn't say that, but that's, that's how I hear it. He's like, uh, you guys got the guards. Go make it as secure as you can. Here's my signet ring. Put a seal around the tomb, the rock that covers the hole. But other than that, secure it as best as you can, is what he tells them. Yeah, good luck with that. If Jesus said he's going to rise from the dead, then let's see if you can stop him. And so that's right where we left off. This is Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, so after that Saturday, died on Friday. Some people believe it was Thursday to get the full three days. But whatever it was, now we're looking at the first day of the week, Sunday, began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And so they're going to come to the tomb and they're going to finish the work of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, according to John's Gospel. They had asked for the body after the death of Jesus so that they can wrap it in linen cloths uh, and then they can embalm him, if you will, putting the spices, 100 pounds worth of spices on his body and laying him in the tomb with this shroud, if you will, okay? Well, they're going to come finish the job. They're going to come and take the body and make sure that he's embalmed correctly and all of that. And so they're at, if, if you will, the lowest of their life, right? 
This is the King. This is the Messiah. This is our Savior. We love Him. But now He's dead. Now hope is gone. Hope is lost. But we still love Him. What He means to us. What He's about. He said something about a kingdom. And, and we don't understand. But we're walking by faith. We're in a moment of life where it doesn't make sense. And it hurts. But we're going to continue to do what we believe to be right. And so that's Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany. The Bible says, to whom much is forgiven, much is expected. Mary Magdalene would be that one that Jesus would exercise seven demons from. Now the Bible doesn't say this, but many scholars and teachers believe that she may very well have been a prostitute because she was from Magdala. Mary Magdalene of Magda, okay? So from that town, and that town was known for prostitution. Some also, theologians and teachers, believe that maybe she was that woman caught in the very act, if you will, of adultery in John chapter 8. And so, too much who has been forgiven. She loved her Savior and she knew what He had delivered her from. Demon possession is an interesting dynamic. We don't just you know, randomly just commit some sin and all of us a sudden find ourselves demon-possessed. It is a deep, deep thing where you have to open yourself up to uh, some pretty intense things before you can be demon-possessed. Now, as Christians, we cannot be demon-possessed, but we can definitely be demon-oppressed. So demons can mess with us from the outside, but they cannot come inside because Jesus is not on the timeshare program. We are the temple of God, right? The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And Jesus ain't tabernacling up with Satan or some demon, right? Um, but nonetheless, people who are demon-possessed, that's a deep level of sin and depravity that the person has had to go into and then open themselves up to to be able to be demon-possessed. It's not this little demon's messing with you and before you know it, you're demon-possessed. It's a deep, deep thing. Usually the occult or... Um, Major, major sin on a level. Drugs is a gateway for the demonic and so those types of things. But nonetheless, Mary Magdalene here show up and Mary of Bethany to the tomb. And again, I want you to picture their lowest state that they could possibly be in. But yet they're walking by faith. We're here for the body. Interesting, if you read through the Gospels, Mary Magdalene says, but how are we going to move the rock? There's a big old stone in front of the grave. How are we going to move it? And just like us, to worry about things that don't even, they need to worry about. Notice verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. So an angel comes, rolls the stone, earthquake. I don't know if the earthquake moved the stone or the angel moved the stone, right? And then he chills on it. He's just sitting on it, you know. Verse 3. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing is white as snow. And so I picture the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus where he turned inside out, right? His insides were showing and it says, man, his clothes were whiter than any launderer could get those white clothes. It was almost illuminating, right? It was lit up. And so it is this, this um, angelic being. His clothing is as white as snow, it says. Verse 4, and the guard, guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And so they have this vision. They see in this angel sitting on this rock, earthquake, cataclysmic things. It was believed there were four guards. So they would serve in two, um, you know, all right, you two got watch and we'll kind of just chill and then we'll switch with you. But on constant rotation, four guards securing the tomb. As secure as, again, the religious leaders could make it. And so these four guards... The angel doesn't address the guards. The angel's not concerned about the guards. The guards are outside of the faith. They're outside of the belief. But these women, this angel wants to minister to them, verse 5. But the angel answered and said, notice, to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Now again, take their lowest possible state of emotion, and it's like, Whoa, what? Are you kidding me? He's not here, an angel. God sent an angel to talk to us. If God wanted a credible witness, he wouldn't have used these two. 
If God wanted somebody who would be able to establish who he is, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany wouldn't be the two. But you know what? The Bible says that God is not a respecter of person. God doesn't look people the way man looks at people. God looks at the heart. And these women came to do a service to the Savior, and God is going to reward them for that. They're the first ones to see the empty tomb. And so the angel lets them know, I know you guys saw Jesus crucified. You were at the crucifixion. You saw him die. You saw him laid in the tomb. You came to finish the job of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. But I'm here to tell you, he's not here. He is risen. And I love that he gets, they get to go in and he said, come see the place where the Lord laid. So it's more than just the word of the angel. You get to see, you get to be eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. Now here's an important theological point. It was a tomb that had never been used. Nobody had ever laid in that tomb. Joseph bought that tomb. He was a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man and he purchased that tomb and he gave it, lend it to Jesus for a night, right? A couple, uh, two and a half days, whatever it was, right? And Jesus laid in that tomb. Why is that important? Why is that significant? Well, if other people had already used that tomb, then you'd see skeletal remains of that, right? And it'd be like, well, how do I know that that one's not Jesus? Or maybe that was uh, Jesus, the Messiah, supposedly. I'm seeing remains. Yeah, okay, you said there was four, now there's only three, but how do I know there were four? No, when they looked into the tomb, guess what? It was empty. There were no remains. The only one that was in that tomb was no longer in that tomb. So I think that's pretty cool. Again, just a little theological fun fact. Moving on, verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so they get to be the first evangelists of speaking of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? That's the gospel. And they get to go and tell the disciples. If you read the other accounts of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you see that not only does the angel tell them, go tell the disciples, but and make sure that you let Peter know. Peter is name by name. Why? Peter just denied him. Peter was probably just walking in shame and guilt and, and just beat up, right, from the enemy and his own flesh. How did I deny him? I said I, would, I said I would die for him. I told him to his face that all these suckers deny you. I'll never deny you. I'm taking my sword. I'll defend you to the death. Tried to chop off the ear of the servant, Malchus, right, or touch the head and got the ear. And so what a beautiful thing. The angels tell these two Go tell the disciples. And by the way, let Peter know as well. Verse 8, So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Again, I put myself in the sandals of these women and I just think, man, sometimes those lowest, lowest, lowest parts of life and then God just does something where you're like, Oh my gosh, I can't even remember what that was like. That horrible feeling of thinking Jesus was just done he is risen like they're just running and they're excited and there's joy it says great joy verse 9 and as they went to tell the disciples behold jesus met them saying rejoice so they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him what an awesome thing so not only did they hear the angel say that he is risen not only did they get to look inside of the tomb and see that it's empty but now Jesus comes to them and they worship at his feet and they grab him. Mary Magdalene, it says in another gospel, gave him a death grip. And he's like, Mary, don't cling to me. Whoa, death grip. I can't breathe, right? And she lets him go. But she's just so excited. Jesus comes. This word that he says to them, rejoice, it's the simplest of greetings. We would say, sup. Not what's up, but S-U-P, sup. That, that's what he's telling her, like, hello, rejoice. It's a simple little greeting, but here I am. Mary Magdalene, here I am. And Mary of Bethany as well, right? Rejoice, and they came and they worshiped. Now, if Jesus isn't God and he's receiving this worship, wouldn't that be wrong? Jesus is God. He's receiving that worship. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So Jesus repeats the message of the angel. 
go to Galilee. I told my disciples to meet me on this certain mountain. That's where I'm going to meet with them. But before that, he meets with two women. Isn't that interesting? If Peter's the first pope, ha, Peter, ha, ha, he didn't even meet with you first. He met with Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany. Why? Because they were at the tomb. Where were the disciples? <laughs> Whatever, all sad and guilty and condemned. Verse 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. That word in the Greek, large sum of money, is a sufficient amount of money. A sufficient amount of money had to be a large sum of money. Why? Because they deserved death because they let their prisoner go. These four guards were commissioned to watch this body. All they were supposed to do is make sure nobody steals this dead dude. That's all you got to do, right? And they failed. So death penalty was theirs. A large sum of money, the religious leaders say, they're going to get together. Saying, uh, when they assembled, the, verse 12, they gave, consulted, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we, were, we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Okay, so let me get this right. Four guards commissioned by Rome to watch a tomb and make sure that the dead man is not stolen out of that tomb or a dead man's body is not stolen out of that tomb in sets of two and two, right? Four guards, two get to rest, two get to stay awake, and then they switch. And while they're, all four of them were sleeping, they know that it was the disciples who rolled this big stone away, no noise there, took the body, no noise there, and they saw him, but their eyes were closed because they were sleeping, and then when they woke up, it was empty. How, like... How much faith would it take for that? But yet that's the story that was, I guess, circulated. That's what went out. And, and here's something that it's frightful for me personally. Nobody so blind as those who are not willing to see. Nobody so blind as those. The religious leaders have the soldiers come and confirm that the body is not there. They know now that Jesus has risen from the dead as he said he would rise. Okay? That's time in your life and that's time in my life to say, what? I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Have you ever experienced God confronting you? I use that word on purpose. Smacking you in the face with a truth that you don't necessarily want to hear. With something that's either uncomfortable or awkward or, ah... Oh, okay. Um, is that the way it is, Jesus? How come it can't be this way? Or, or how come... Here, let me counsel you, God. How come you can't do it like this instead? Where the Lord confronts you with the truth. Now, you have an option in that time. You, you have an option. You can be like these religious leaders and say, -k 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 -k. Here you go, God, Heisman. I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to go on believing the lie because I want my life on earth to be a lot more comfortable than what I would have to do had I been confronted with this truth and accepted. I would have to change some things. I would have to do something different if this were true. I'd have to humble myself for sure and repent and acknowledge, oh, snaps, I was wrong. Wow, he rose from the dead. They're confronted with this truth, the most powerful truth on the earth. And what do they do? Cover it up. We got to cover it up. We got to smooth. Get the iron out. Let's wrinkle. Let's iron the wrinkles. Let's, let's make this smooth over. And by the way, we'll, we'll tell the uh, leaders. We'll tell Pilate. We'll take care of them for you. We're going to give you a large sum of money. And then we're going to take care of the governor and the political machinery. Don't worry about it. You guys are safe. That to me is just sad. And the Lord will confront us. The Lord will confront us with truths. That sometimes, oh, all right, Lord, hmm. Yeah, you remain God and I remain your servant. I remain in submission to you and truth. And so, wow, I might not, mm, this might not make me feel comfortable right now. I might not like what I'm hearing. But Lord, you're giving me this truth. Ah, that means 
I, I, got, I got to contend with this. And that should happen to all of us in our walks with the Lord. Now, we get to the last section, verses 16 through 20. Let me read you 16 and 17. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And so that's beautiful. Then Jesus gives them the message of the Great Commission, what we know as the Great Commission. But the Great Commission is found in more than just one of the Gospels. To be able to know what the Great Commission is, we have to look at all four of the Gospels, and we need to look at the book of Acts as well. Okay? So this is what I want to do. The title of the message is Commissioned. A subtitle or another kind of title that I thought about when I first started reading this week was the receipt for the payment. We just went through the receipt for the payment. Okay, The payment was the cross. Jesus paid for your sins, my sins on the cross. He said to Talistai, paid in full in the Greek. The Greek word is to Talistai. The debt has been paid in full. The propitiation, the appeasement of the wrath of God has been met. Because of the receipt, the resurrection. So Jesus is the first of those who have been resurrected. But you say, wait, 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 no, no, no. There's the widow in Nain. There's uh, Lazarus was resurrected. And there was Jairus' daughter, right? No, no, no. They were resuscitated. They were brought back to life. They would eventually die again. Jesus is resurrected to never die again. The first fruits, the Bible declares, of the resurrection. Meaning, because He lives, we will live. And when Jesus is talking to His disciples, I think they were talking about the religious leaders, or something was happening where Jesus had instructed them, go tell them that I am the God of the living. I am the God of the living, not of the dead. And so because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead. We will live forever forever with him. So that's the receipt for the payment, the resurrection. If Jesus just died on the cross and went through all of that and never rose from the dead, then he's no different than any other religious leader in the world. No different than Gandhi, no different than Muhammad, no different than all of these other religious leaders that are elevated, right? All of them are dead, buried, and in their tomb. You can go and see bones or remains. So now we get to this idea of commissioned and the Great Commission. Let me read you out of the four Gospels. If you're taking notes, you can write down Mark's Gospel 16, 15 through 18. Mark's Gospel chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. And I'm going to read you each one of these, and then we'll wrap up with Matthew 28, the end there, as I break that down. Let's see if I can get you out of here. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, the Bible says, And he said to them, again, these are all after the resurrection. This is the, the, the fullness, if you will, of the Great Commission. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay? So the operative part of that first one is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Before you make disciples, you've got to share the gospel. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, what we're going to study at the end. And Jesus came, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So the important part of that second part is go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then he says, baptizing them, teaching them uh, as I commanded you, okay? John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. John's gospel, chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's John 20, 21 through 28. 
Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, 20, uh, 46 through 49. Again, that's Luke's Gospel, 24, 46 through 49. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So the operative part of that, uh, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry until you are endued with power from on high. And then finally, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to, to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay? So all of those give us a picture of what God wants us to do. Mark's gospel tells us that we need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew's gospel tells us that we need to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them all the things that he has commanded. John's gospel says that we have peace as the Father has sent Jesus, so he's going to send us, and we need to receive the Holy Spirit. Luke's gospel tells us that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations and that he is going to send the promise of the Father so that we are endued with power from on high. And then Acts tells us that we are to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he will give us power, deutimus, to do what he's called us to do in Jerusalem, home base, Judea, kind of surrounding areas, Samaria, the outcasts of the world, and then the uttermost parts of the world when we go to missions across the seas, okay? And so that right there, in my opinion, is, is a more fuller aspect of the Great Commission. Now, let's break down Matthew's Great Commission, Matthew 28, and let's look at verses 18 through 20. We'll close here with this. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Why is that important? That all authority has been given to Jesus. Because he is giving you that authority. The sins that you remain. Remember what he said in John's gospel? Let's see. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What? You can declare who's forgiven and whose sins are going to remain with them. As you go out in the Great Commission, as you go out to share the gospel, as you go out and you're sharing with somebody, and they're stubborn and they're stuck and they're like, ah, I want nothing to do with God. I, want... I have had hospital calls. And I've gone into hospitals. And I go on usually with my Bible. And my Bible's pretty big. Now I can take my phone and they don't know. I'm undercover with my phone. Right? But when I go in with my Bible, they're like, oh my gosh, what is that thing? Get that away from me. Whoa, back you. Right? And it's like, oh, it's the Bible. It's where it God's. God's a love letter. Right? And I have had people tell me, do not come into my room. I don't want prayer. I don't want anything to do with you. I've had, I've had family members call me and tell me that their loved one is, is, is about to die. They're in the hospital. They're on their deathbed. This is before COVID. And now it's all, you got to jump through crazy hoops to get into hospitals. But back in the days, I would make these hospital calls and I'd go in my Bible. And I literally had people say, I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do. Don't even pray for me. And I'd be like... Well, I'm going to pray for you around the corner. And then I run around the corner and pray, and pray for them. But I mean, think about that. Based on that, I can say, if you do not do business with God, whatever is hurting in your heart, whatever you're going through, no matter how you're feeling right now, if you do not repent, you're going to live in eternity apart from God, separated from God. And you don't say that like boastfully. You don't say that like with arrogance. 
You say that apologetically. Do you realize that you're about to go into eternity? You are going to stand before God. You're going to stand before your Creator. Come on. Don't be hard-hearted. Based on that attitude, you will be separated from God forever. Because He will not force you. We can say that. And likewise, we can share the gospel with somebody. And we can say, hey, 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 this is awesome. You've prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Based on that, you have eternity with God. Now continue to walk in the ways of the Lord. Right? He's given us that authority to be able to proclaim those things. And so that authority that he says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's saying, children... I'm giving you that authority. Then he says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The only strong command in this chapter is make disciples. Everything is in the past, everything after that is in the passive voice, meaning what it is to make a disciple. He goes on to say, after that strong command, make disciples of all nations, baptizing is soft. That's what it means to make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them is in the soft command. So the command of the Great Commission is make disciples. How do I do that? Make sure they get baptized. Make sure you teach them all things that I've commanded you. That's what making a disciple is. Okay? Uh, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I'll close with two things. One, true story, there was this guy that these missionaries came to in some place where his name was Lo. L-O. Of all names, that was his name. Obviously Asian. But he was, missionaries come, and they're sharing with him, and they come second, third time, and he's like, I'm done with you guys. Get out of here. I want nothing to do with you. I'm confused. Too many beliefs. Too many religions. I don't want anything to do with you. And they say, let us give you a Bible. Let us leave you at least with God's love letter. Just take his Bible and, and read it. And he'll reveal himself to you through his love letter. And he's like reluctantly, all right, give me, give me. And he goes into his house. And his fireplace is running. And he takes the Bible and he throws it into his lit fireplace. And he wakes up in the morning. And there's nothing but ashes except for one page that has words from the Bible and it's Matthew 28 and it says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And he gives his life to the Lord and he goes and finds those missionaries and he serves the Lord for the rest of his life. True story. I was like, no, I can't be true. That would have to be a miracle. Yeah, God's in the business of miracles. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. Also, I was disillusioned with discipleship and the church in a whole, as a whole um, as it related to discipleship. I said to myself as I was praying, uh, Lord, we're not, we're not doing the Great Commission. Simply put, we're not, we're not doing what you've commanded us to do. You've left, left us with this commission. You've left us with this right of discipleship. Now, in the book of the epistle of 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 3, Paul would say that every single one of us is responsible to plant seeds of faith in people's lives and to water seeds that have already been planted. And if there's any growth, if anybody gives their life to God, if anybody surrenders their heart to Jesus, that growth that comes out of their life is to the glory of God. He's the one, it says clearly in that, script, in that chapter, that God brings forth the growth. But who are we? We're just servants of the Lord who plant seeds of faith, and we water seeds. That is an aspect of discipleship, but that's not discipleship. Discipleship is invested in a life for a season long enough to be able to teach them all things that God has commanded. It's, it's spending time. It's messy. It's ugly. It's uncomfortable sometimes. It's inconvenient. But yeah, but and then I got to sit with them. I got to listen to their stories. And it's so boring. Yeah, that's the Great Commission. God wants you and I invested in somebody's life long enough to be able to share with them these wonderful truths in the scriptures. And that's the Great Commission. 
Generally speaking, I've had people come to me and tell me, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Can you help me? Yeah, you're asking for help. I want to help you. Okay, so let's go through some random book or let's go through some type of thing where we can get into the scriptures and we can understand what, it's, what, what God's word has to say about that one thing. And then you're discipling somebody and your lives are intertwined and you can pray for one another, but you as somebody who knows a little bit more can take somebody who doesn't know maybe as much as you know you're not supposed to take all this information and just, um, 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 I like eating, um, 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 I eat, and I get fat. No, you're supposed to give out as well, right? What you're taking in. So that's an important aspect of discipleship. I don't know how God is calling you to do it. I don't know what God is calling you specifically to do, but God is calling all of us to make disciples of all nations. And we do that by... Sharing repentance, as Mark's gospel says, sharing the gospel with people, watching them get saved, and then being available to teach them truths in the scriptures. And sometimes maybe it's, it's brief, and maybe sometimes it's longer. There is one scripture that I wanted to close with. It's found in Luke's gospel, chapter 19, verse 13. The Bible says, And he called his servants and delivered to them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy until I come. And so this master was going to go and secure a kingdom in this parable in Luke's gospel. He was going to go secure a kingdom. But he said, while I'm gone securing that kingdom, I want you to be busy about my business. I want you to occupy until I come. So he took 10 minas. Mina was about one mina. Is a, it's a denomination. It's, it's an amount of money. But it was about three months wages. And he has 10 minas and he gives one to 10 dudes. And then these guys come back when he comes back from his securing his kingdom and they give an account. And in that account one, the guy who had one, the first guy, he's like, here, Lord, here, you gave me one mina and I gave you 10 back. Wow, it's pretty awesome. And then this guy, Lord, I had one mina and I gave you five back. And then the other guy buried his mina and he did nothing with it. I believe discipleship is what our investment is. There's no greater way to invest in eternity and the kingdom of God than to walk in obedience to the Great Commission. It's called the Great Commission because it is great. And again, it does get a little sloppy and it does get a little uncomfortable and it does mean that we have to take our time and invest it in another human being. But that's what God has called us to do. And what do we get when we give out in this way you get far more than you give because God will be a debtor to no man. You cannot outgive God. And so what I've learned when I do disciple somebody is, man, their lives are messed up, but it's no different than my life. And if I really, really sit here and think about it, yeah, I'm not struggling with the same exact sins that they're struggling with, but if I'm true to myself, I'm struggling. There's things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. There's things that I know I should be doing that I'm not. Sins of omission and commission. Things I do and things that I know I should be doing and I'm not. And what it does is it sparks my faith. It sparks me. And then when you have a new believer and you're discipling them, their excitement, it like rubs off on you. You're like, oh my gosh, dude, this is real, man. Guess what God did last week? I gotta tell you. And you're like, what do you do? What do you do, man? Were you were you the low in the in the in the? No, nah, your name was low, and you found that one. You know, you have stories like that, and you're like, what the heck? Like God is still moving. God is still working. God is still doing things. And so that's awesome about discipleship. I want to encourage you guys with that. Let's pray. Father, we have been commissioned to invest in lives. Lord, of course, our children. What a blessing and an honor to be able to disciple our children, Lord. And so for those who have young ones, Lord, as they look forward to being able to just daily share scriptures and your love and they get to model what it is to be saved in front of them, what it means to pray, Lord, to pray for their food, to pray for their boo-boos, their little hurts, Lord, I just, I pray your anointing upon every parent in here that has an opportunity, Lord, to disciple their little ones, to see them come to faith in you. And Lord, we look forward to that day when they confess you as Lord and Savior. But may their parents be anointed 
and commissioned to be able to disciple them. And Father, you're, you're, you're putting people maybe on some of our minds, people at work, people that in our family, friends that we know that have been asking. And so Lord, I pray that we would just step out in faith and spend some time with them. Try to meet once a week, once a month, whatever, just to be able to teach from your word. Go through a book with them. And so Father, again, you're anointing upon them. They are commissioned. We are commissioned. And I pray that we would heed the call for your glory, Lord, as we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when it's all said and done, in Jesus' name, amen.